nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may we have the roll call, please? James Hebert? Here. Peter Freilinger? Here. David Bork? Here. Shelley Stevenson? Here. And Christine Snow? Here. Okay. And for the one, two, three, four, five, and for the record tonight, we, uh, Ms. Snow and uh, Ms. Stevenson are both voting members, so everybody here is a voting member tonight. Ms. Snow is always a voting member. Ms. Snow is always <laughs> a voting member, excuse me. Yes. But definitely a voting member for everybody, yes. Um, thank you very much. You don't get the vote twice. Then. You don't get the vote twice. <laughs> Has any has everyone had a chance to review the meeting minutes from September 14th, our last meeting last month? Does anybody have any questions or any comments, edits? Excellent. I'll have a yes, Mr. Uh, Bork. Yeah, I was not here for the meeting, but I did view the entire meeting uh, on the YouTube channel. Great. Uh, so I, w I feel that I'm qualified in order to comment. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes, minutes as presented. Mr. So Bork, uh, Mr. Freilinger, so moved. And second, Mr. Bork. Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That vote. Uh, and one abstention. One, two, three, four, yay. One abstention. Uh, thank you very much. All right, first on our agenda, we have a six month extension request by Michael Rickman of Custom Concepts on behalf of Ross Family <laughs> LLC for appeal 2724, a limited reduction of yard size residential appeal approved on April 13th, 2022, and the withdrawal of appeal 2736, which we heard last month, if you all recall, variance appeal on 10th 9th Street. Um, missed, we don't have to have him speak at this point. We just, yeah. It's your discretion. Yeah. Um, Mr. Rickman, would you like to speak on this? Pretty. There, so the, the gentleman for us, we, they're asking for a six-month extension on the, on the uh, appeal that we granted them in April. They asked for um, something additional last month, and they decided to just go ahead with the original plan, but they're asking for an additional uh, amount of time to make that happen. I personally don't see an issue with this, but I'll entertain any comments from the board. Questions? No? Okay. Then we're going to do an up and down vote on this one. All those in favor of approving the six-month extension for appeal number 2724, please raise your hand. All right. That is unanimous. Six-month extension is granted. Uh, next, we have the approval of the draft written decisions for appeals heard at the September 14th meeting. The first one is appeal number 2734, special exception appeal. Have we all had a chance to review the notes? Uh, Mr. Bork, you stated that you've watched the last month's meeting, so you feel competent to vote on these. I um, do not. And you do not. Thank you, Ms. Snow, for clarifying. You can just abstain for these following three. Um, any questions, comments? Okay. I'll entertain a motion to approve appeal number 2734, written decision. Mr. Bork? So moved. Second? Second. Mr. Freilinger, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That is uh, one, two, three, four, yay, one abstention. Uh, next. We have the draft written decisions for appeal number 2735, miscellaneous appeal by Jessica Stomberg um, on behalf of Cross Holt Roads Holdings. Has everyone had a chance to review those findings? Are there any comments? Excellent. Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, yes. Motion. Yes. Motion to approve. <laughs> Thank you very much. And the second? Second. Mr. Freilinger, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All right. That is four yay and one abstention. Uh, appeal number, draft and decision for appeal number 2737, Practical Difficulty Variance Appeal by Mike Rickman at Custom Concepts on behalf of Thomas E. and Gwen M. Moore of 8 Shell Street. And I'm presuming everyone has also had a chance to review those minutes. And I am not seeing any comment. I'll entertain a motion to approve, Mr. Bork. Motion to approve. And the second, Mr. Frowling, oh, Ms. Snow, thank you. Uh, Ms. Stevenson, excuse me. <laughs> Yeah, good. That's the second by Ms. Stevenson. Thank you. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All right. Any abstentions? One abstention. Great. Four, four yay and one abstention. All right. Our first uh, item, new item that we have here for new business, this is a shoreland setback determination by Mike Rickman of Custom Concepts Incorporated on behalf of Harold and Kathy Caldwell, 64 Jones Creek, Drive, Assessor's Map U022, Lot 29. Uh, Mr. Rickman, why don't you please um, thank you for setting up and let us, uh, once you're all set up, let us know why you're here and what you're asking for. Uh, 
Good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mike Richman, Custom Concepts, here again. Um, tonight I'm here on behalf of my clients, Harold and Kathy Caldwell of 64 Jones Creek Drive on Pine Point, requesting a determination of meeting setback to the greatest practical extent. I'll give you some highlights here and then I'll open myself up to questions. Um, I've been working with Harold and Kathy to develop a design to replace their existing cottage into a place that they can call home for many years. This parcel is located on the north side of Pine Point and faces the marsh. Uh, it contains an existing cottage and a detached outbuilding. And it's, it's relatively flat, but it does slope a little bit from, from front to back towards the marsh. We plan, I do want a, a couple important notes. We do plan on designing the structure to comply with the proposed changes to the floodplain. So therefore, by definition, it would kind of be a stilt house. So something we don't have to do quite yet, but we're, we want to do the right thing. The existing structure was built around the year nine, uh, around 1900, and it's simply beyond repair. Um, it was never intended to be anything more than an old seasonal cottage, and um, shows extensive structural rot. And um, in our opinion, it's, it's not worth the salvage. Um, the current cottage, however, uh, sits within the 75 foot setback to the high water line. Overall goals, construct a year round home for them to enjoy, utilize the one time 30% expansion possibility, maximize the height allowed even though um, it's gonna be much, much shorter than neighboring properties. And one of the biggest things that they've come to me with is re they really wanna minimize the impact to the environment during construction as well as well as be good long-term stewards to the to the environment um, including extra insulation it's going to be a super insulated home and we want to put solar panels on it for um, solar gain solar power so the resulting design it's a very modest home covered parking for only one vehicle um, very low ceilings and a very low pitch roof line because of the, the height limitation so we've discussed this the placement of this home in great length with the owners and Poor Mr. Longstaff. We respect the value and the setbacks from the property lines very well, as well as the setbacks from the marsh, but we find ourselves requesting the location of this for several reasons, which I've included in your packet. So please allow me to highlight some of these. Um, number one, there's, there's a big existing tree right in front of this home. We had a qualified arborist view this tree and agreed that it's a very valuable tree given that there's not many trees in that area. We've been informed that we should ensure that any new structure is at least 10 feet away from the furthest extent from the, the root system. Um, we must also keep in mind that we need to minimize disturbance of construction equipment during construction, which can be difficult to manage. When we began this process, uh, I was not at all aware of a, a small ditch in the back of the property that would have a great impact on the 75 foot setback from the marsh. Uh, the town of Scarborough GIS website does not show this ditch, but when we had a professional survey completed, it showed this narrow ditch extending towards the cottage. Yep, thank you, Brian. In reality, this ditch is, is very small. In fact, you can easily jump over it. Um, however, its impact to the setback line is enormous and is probably the biggest need for this determination tonight. Without the impact of this ditch line and of the highest annual tide, extended in more of a typical fashion, the rear of this existing cottage would be well beyond the 100 foot setback and the Caldwell family could build exactly where they are today. So we appreciate that the ditch is, it's real, right? It's there, but it's such a small sliver and has an enormous impact. In addition to that, the, this property is located in a B1 zone and it's bordered by a business to the east. The parking lot for this business is very close to the Caldwell's property line, and it brings with it the typical noise and associated with a commercial property. So therefore, the closer we pull to the road, the more exposed the Caldwell's are to this activity. Yes, the Caldwell's could install a, a huge fence or screen or something to help shield that, um, but I think we would all agree that that's not, you know, <laughs> that's not good for, good for anybody. The ad adjacent property to the west is quite large and tall. I don't know if any of you had an opportunity to, to, to drive by the site, um, but, it, but it has quite an impact. While touring the site, I realized that the Caldwell's home is quite literally in the shadow of this house to the west. 
we acknowledge and appreciate that one property owner is not responsible for any shadows they cast onto another property owner. We get that. We're not asking for relief from that. Um, but it's very real. They, they, the Caldwells do not wish to have a big, tall house. If they move closer to the road, they can have a big and tall house, but they don't want that. So if we're forced to maintain in the shadow of this big house, it, you know, blocking the sun and blocking sun from potential solar panels when the sun is low, um, it's a real issue. So another issue or point um, is the streetscape. Another benefit to our pro proposed location is the overall benefit to the streetscape. If we are forced to push it closer to the road, it will literally crowd out the existing small building by the road, as well as be really close and impactful to that home to the west, which again is, is pretty large. This is in your packet, but I thought it was worth printing larger. To show, these, to show these differences, excuse me. If we're forced to place it closer to the road, you can see how tight it is to the west, to the building to the west, and to the existing building on the site. If we're allowed to keep it closer to where it is now, much more breathing room here. This is the commercial building. This is the large house to the west. As far as the shadows, this is actually a pretty realistic model. We use some modeling software to do this. <clears throat> same, same scenarios. If we're forced to close, push it much closer to the road, you can see the impact of this thing. This is very real. If we're allowed to keep it closer to where it is, there's a lot of relief to be gained for sunlight. So our proposed location has been developed over many renditions and conversations as we try to find the, the middle ground here. Um, they truly want to minimize their impact in many ways, which led to this location. So with that, I open myself up to any questions. All right, thank you. I'll start with one question first, and I'll get to you, Ms. Stevenson. In that rendering there, is the shadowing rendering, is the shadow render modeled at, say, uh, sunset or afternoon? No, if I remember correctly, it was mid-afternoon. Mid-afternoon, so 2, 3 o'clock or something three, like that. I think that. it was right around 3 o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Stevenson, your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, in the, that top left picture where you would bring it forward, where is that tree in, in regards to that building? Is the tree gone at that point? Correct. Right, right under the house. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> two questions. Um, first off, uh, th that creek that you mentioned, um, do you have any provenance on it? It, it? A lot of those small creeks in that area, and for full disclosure, I live in Blue Point and spend a lot of time in Pine Point, so I, I, I kind of know the area fair, fairly well. A lot of those are historically man-made. Do you know any, have any provenance or, or, or history on this creek? Wow, that's an excellent question. I don't know. I, I don't know. The land beside it um, looks like it was built up a little bit because it's flat, and ours kind of has a natural slope to it. So it may have been created when the person on the right wanted theirs out, and they built it up a little bit. Yeah, there are quite a few of those, especially as I look at that straight creeks, which were designed to drain land to, um, to provide a drainage um, to, to create more buildable land or, or usable land nearby, in which case I think that it would be worth consider or I don't know that for certain, but a man-made creek would be, in my mind, different from a natural creek from a shoreland um, perspective. Um, the other question I have, and, and I'll admit that I've eaten more at Salty's Bay to, than, than I probably really should, um, the, the, you mentioned it's in a B1 zone. Um, if you move the house forward, you're very close to the parking area there, and I know that little building next door there is kind of their, effectively their bar. 
um, or they've used it in the past for their for their for their for their for their, for their bar. Mm -hmm. um, have, have you communicated or have you talked with the owners? And I know that property has been transitioning over time. Have you talked to the owners about that at all in terms of how that would work? Uh, I I have not. Um, I don't know if the owners have. I mean, we 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 talked to them because we're neighbors with yeah. them. Mm -hmm. um, You want to approach the yeah, if you're going to answer a question, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind, just so we can have it all recorded on the record, we can't pick up anything from the audience. Just state your name and and so uh, Kathy answer. Caldwell, 64 Jones Creek Drive. Thank you. Um, we haven't spoken with them about the exact location. They're actually kind of busy over the summer because they do have the Salty Bay and the tavern that they're running. Mm -hmm. So we mostly just wave, and so we haven't had a conversation or real discussion. Okay. But they know we're planning on doing something. And then last question, just it wasn't clear. What is that building closest to the street on your property? Is that a, a shed or is that a garage or what is that? Um, actually, somebody <coughs> lived in it. It used. Yeah. It has a um, an old like kitchen countertop and sink, and then a um, what was it like a outpipe for a toilet? And um, they must have had like a wood stove or something because there's a big. Pipe for heating. And nothing's contemplated with that uh, 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 associated with this discussion at all? Not with this. Okay, got yeah. it. Got it. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Mr. Bork? Okay. Um, I'd like to re refer to the standards uh, in the sh for shoreland zoning. And uh, one of them, uh, just to read from here, is that... Um, should uh, any non-conforming building or structure be destroyed or damaged regardless of the cause by more than 50% of the market value of the structure before such damage, destruction, or removal, it may be rebuilt or restored, provided the permit is obtained within a period of 18 months of the date of said damage. So my question is this. Uh, when did, you know, first of all, how long have you owned the property? Uh, we purchased the property... September of 2020. Okay. So about two years ago. Yeah. All right. So that's beyond the 18 months. Okay. When did you become aware that the, the, the home was... Are you, are you living in the home right now? No. You're not. Okay. So when did you become aware of the fact that the, dam the, the home was damaged beyond repair, meaning more than 50% damaged market value? And what, what proof do you have of that? Exactly, when we hired Mike. <laughs> so we met with Mike August about a year ago, um, just had an initial meeting. He's been quite busy, so he hasn't really um, been able to get us in his schedule until just about the last couple of months. Um, we had When we had the survey done, which that took quite some time as well, so it's been two years in the making and it's been a very, very slow process because the surveyors were so busy and so it's, we had to do that first and then finally connect with Mike after that. So um, if we had, could have done this much sooner, believe me, <laughs> we would have. <laughs> uh, Mike, could you please give us some information regarding the extent of the damage of this house and proof that it's been, it, it, the market value has to is worth 50% less Mr. than Chair. what it originally yeah. was. Uh, one second, David. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Bork, I think you're misinterpreting the, the wording in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. They don't have to demonstrate that there's any damage to the house. The way it's worded is if they choose to remove it by 50% or more of the market value, they're talking about tearing the house down. So that would be more than 50%. When they do that, they then have to demonstrate that they've they either can't move it back to the greatest practical extent or the setback or or they've moved it back as far as they can. And, and that's that's what that means. It if if it was damaged by less than like a tree fell on the roof and it was damaged by less than fifty percent, they can they can build it back within with a permit within twelve months. Okay. So it's it's not it's not something they have to prove to you. It's just it's just that if if they decide to tear half the house down <coughs> Or, or 51 percent of the, the house down, or 51 percent of the market value. That's when they would have to come and and and, and prove that that they're going to remove the whole house. That's what they're talking well, about. Thank you for clarifying yeah. that, Brian, yeah. because I, I really didn't understand the language yeah. in that. 
Yeah. And shoreland zoning is something that we don't see all the time. Mm -hmm. so, and so this is a difficult one for us to comprehend, if you don't mind. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Would, would you add anything uh, to that? Uh, no, I guess to answer your question prior, uh, first visit to the house, it was very obvious that it was beyond repair. Yeah. It's really tilted. Put your head underneath that thing. There's an access panel within one minute. I'm like, wow, this is very tired need to, needs to go. So that was my very first visit. Other questions? Have you studied what any sort of potential environmental impact would be of raising the house and replacing it in the same location as far as you're confident that <coughs> this level of construction in this space isn't going to sort of upset or provide any environmental impact in this area? No, in, in fact, I would actually submit that if we're allowed to keep it where we're showing it, it'd probably be the least impact. I mean, right now, all the, the soils are underneath this house. They, they're, you know, they're, they've been impacted for many, many years, since 1900. If we come forward, all that is nice lawn right now. Um, and huge impact to the tree. The tree is a, is a big concern. So I think we, we've moved back, I think it was eight feet-ish, seven foot ten-ish. Um, in my opinion, you know, we could put the silt fence up there, and I think construction equipment could stay there. So technically, we wouldn't really be impacting any more, anything closer to the marsh that's impacted today because we're going to give ourselves that little bit of a work buffer. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Uh, yes, for the question. Uh, are you on a septic system there? No, this is it's sewer. Public. Yeah, public so sewer. Public water and sewage. Correct. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? Comments? Um, and right now, you're proposing to have the house in its exact location, and it's not going to be any closer to the road or farther away from the shoreland, that finger ditch. Or is that going to be eight feet farther away, you're saying? So. Technically, no. Technically, we are we, we do plan on pulling further away from the marsh by about eight feet. Odd geometry, though. I can show you this. I printed it nice and large. Sorry. Which way is this? So, it, it, technically, we'd be a back about seven or eight, almost eight feet further than it is now. Real, real quick, Mr. Richmond, um, orientation. Where's the road there? Yeah, hold on. No, I have a better scenario. It's all good. Take your time. <laughs> I came prepared on this one. So the view on the left is the existing conditions. Right here, technically, is the closest portion to this finger, if you will, this ditch. Mm -hmm. The proposed, I'm coming about eight feet closer to the road. So technically, I'm a little bit further away from the ditch. And I'm definitely further away from the resource in the back. And to me, that's what's offering up now this space that's currently occupied the house that we can use for construction. Okay. And therefore, you're slightly closer to the road. Correct. But still far enough from the tree that you're, you don't believe there's an impact to the tree in construction or in the final location. Well put. I think we found the happy, gotcha. the happy medium. Okay. Just want to be clear. Thank you. Uh, according, to the, yeah, according to the, the drawing, you're, you're two inches further away from the, from the ditch. Correct. 29.5 versus 29.3. Correct. But due to the odd geometry of this thing, on this side, I'm, more, I'm almost eight feet back. Yeah. So it just... But the, we're, we're, we're looking at the closest point. That's, yeah. That's what we're... Right. And your, your argument, Mr. Richmond, is that more of the mass of the house is farther away, further away. Correct. Thank you. Um, for me, I like to see that it's being moved further away from the hazard, not the hazard, but the shoreland, <laughs> that they're trying to make some amends to make it closer to the road. Um, additional comments? 
questions? Uh, have Mr. Longstaff, I know this isn't part of the normal, I guess, procedure for this, but we have any, have we received any written uh, comments or uh, is anyone here from the public that wanted to speak with regard to this particular application? Uh, because this is not a variance it's appeal, not a um, we don't notify abutters, so no one that abuts the property would, would know this. Okay. This is a zoning board determination of greatest practical extent of the setback. Um, I don't know if anyone in the audience is here to speak on this behalf or not, because they could certainly look at the agenda mm -hmm. posted online. Absolutely. And I guess I'll offer it to anyone here that would like to speak on that. Seeing none, I will close that opportunity. Thank you. Um, I always want to make sure everyone has a chance to speak. Uh, I guess at this point, what we're looking at is uh, a vote up and down to allow this construction to take place. We are also uh, able to put any, um, we can amend the, we can amend our vote to include any restrictions or uh, considerations on the property if we wanted to do so. Uh, Mr. Frylinger? Just a question again, this is because we don't deal with zoning, uh, the shoreland um, uh, 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 setback issues very often. Is there a DEP thing that comes in through this or anything that from the state that we have to deal with or just a question? I, I, I don't want to... No, that's good. Is, and, and the question would be, do, would this be pending a DEP, uh, uh, not guidance, but letter? Yeah. Mr. Long. Uh, yeah, I think for a replacement structure, there, there would probably be a permit by rule. Um, there also is the requirement because they're um, expanding the structure, they would need to um, record the approved plan, whatever that may be, uh, would have to be recorded in the registry, and they also have to take before and after photos. So there's all kinds of checks and balances built into the shoreland zoning. But that's not something that precedes us or anything like that? That's all part of the permitting. Okay, just, gotcha. uh, again, just... At, at my level. <laughs> got it, fair enough. Yeah. I just want to make sure. So there are additional there are additional steps that will take place here, specifically the DEP permit by rule. So they will have a chance to weigh in on this as well, for the board's information. Okay. I guess at this time, yes, go ahead, Mr. Richmond. May I add one more thing? Sure. Um, one more restriction on this lot, which there's been a lot. On the right hand side of this property, there's a jog in the property line, right here towards the commercial building, which is right here. When we offset that for a side setback, it creates this little bump right here. Doesn't seem like a lot until you're really trying to lay out a house for people. <laughs> the further, the, I, you, I'm actually one inch from that bump right there. So tr as I, if I had to push it forward, this house now is forced to become even narrower than it is. And if I showed you the floor plans, I've I've had my shoehorn out trying to get a, a reasonably sized house in this. So just that's what I'm up against. Yep. No, I appreciate that. So you're looking at side back constrictions as well. Very tight ones. I'll entertain a motion at this time to approve this um, setback determination as currently presented. Mr. Bork? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. I'll uh, reserve this time for any further discussion, comments. Okay, uh, seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All right, that is unanimous. Thank you very much. For our next item on our agenda, we are looking at, <clears throat> excuse me. We're looking at our 2738 was withdrawn. Is that correct, Mr. Longstaff? That is correct. Okay, so we are looking at appeal number 2739. This is a miscellaneous appeal by Big Mountain Realty Trust, 36 Running Hill Road, Assessor's Map R018, Lot 39. Uh, please come on ahead, step forward, present your material, tell us who you are, why you're here, and uh, we can start off. Very good. Um, good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Stephen Keenan. Um, I work with the Keenan Auction Company. I wanted to give you just a quick brief uh, history of who we are and what we're doing uh, here tonight. Um, I work with an auction company, as I mentioned. It's a small family auction company. Uh, we are uh, located here in Maine and 
have conduct, conduct auctions of real estate and personal property uh, throughout uh, Maine and New England. Uh, we've been doing this for over 50 years and uh, we've conducted well over 8,500 auctions. Uh, we have a beautiful office up here on Outer Congress Street up by Unum. Uh, it's quite nice and uh, one of our problems is we're a little restricted on space there. So uh, when we purchased the property, we realized it and we've been on, uh, historically we've been looking for the past you know, year and a half for a facility and we've landed on this property out on uh, 36 Running Hill Road. Uh, we have needs for storage of equipment for our uh, company's own personal use uh, within our business, but also we have needs to store equipment on this facility and on this site for our clients. Um, that's equipment and personal property that would be earmarked for sale at an auction in the future. Um, and that would be an online internet type auction. Uh, and then there may be rare small live auction needs at this site as well. Uh, last evening we were at the planning board meeting and the uh, planning board uh, informed us that they advised the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals here, the ZBA, to approve our condition. Um, and we were happy about that, but they also indicated that they um, had a, uh, a contingency uh, attached to it that uh, basically states that it would be pending the outcome of a phase two environmental site assessment report and then uh, performing any necessary remediations that would be associated with that report. The overall application that we've submitted, I think it's important to bring up a few key points. Um, the use that we're proposing for this site at 36 Running Hill Road is a much less intrusive use as compared to the existing that's there now. Um, we are looking at a facility that would not house or store uh, contaminated or hazardous type materials. Um, we would not have bulk storage of fuels and diesel fuels and that sort of thing that uh, currently takes place there now. Uh, so there'd be a much lesser impacted use on the site with our proposed use. I would also state that if you haven't been by uh, the Goldstein Steel uh, Scrapyard, um, you're going to see a much cleaner property there. You're going to have a very well orderly um, uh, contained property. Uh, we've also earmarked plans to reside the building and the roof and clean up the property to give it a professional look, uh, which we're accustomed to with any of the properties we've owned. There's a large fence around the property. We're happy to have it remain. Uh, it just adds to security features to the site, which are important to us. There's also trees and buffers that are between us and the residential neighbor, um, and those would uh, remain as well. The, I think one of the big points to our application, or, or at least to us, uh, our company, is we are very extremely environmentally conscious, okay? Um, this is not the first time we've been involved with a property that has had potential environmental problems. Um, over our 50-year history, we've had two other properties that we've been involved with in purchasing that uh, had required uh, remediation costs to go into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, so this is not new to us, but yet we are very cautious and we're conscious about what's going on with these properties that we're involved with. Um, we're good stewards to real estate. We're good stewards to property that we occupy on a temporary basis to help clients sell their equipment and their stuff. So we're, we're very aware of our, our surroundings and what we're doing. Um, we're, as it relates to the environmental uh, concerns with this property, we're three to five steps ahead of the planning board on this. Um, we put this property under contract way back in August and um, immediately began uh, conducting and hiring and paying for phase one environmental and phase two reports. Um, the phase ones are completed, of course, and we're halfway through our phase two environmental site assessment, well before even making application to the town of Scarborough. It's important to us. Um, I do a lot of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I do a lot of governmental work. Um, I do work for the courts of the bankruptcy courts. I have to make sure I'm clean all the way around. Um, and so it's very important to us when we get involved in real estate that we know what, we're, what we have for environmental concerns. The uh, first thing I would be uh, telling you is that if we find a problem at this site we're, that's insurmountable in terms of cost, it's too expensive in other words to clean up and remediate, we're gone. We're out of the deal and we walk away. Our contract is contingent upon that. 
um, the results of the report might come up clean. So great, we're, we're all happy. Um, happy to share the report with you. Um, if we have a, a low financial impact cleanup that we're presented with, and one that we think makes sense and is affordable and go through it, great. We're all happy to go forward and clean up our site and move forward. But uh, again, I can't stress enough that uh, we do not intend to proceed with the purchase of the property if we find um, a bad result with this environmental uh, phase two report. I bring all of this up to you because I know we received an approval with a pending condition, so in my mind we don't have an approval. Um, maybe you can speak to that differently, but that's the way I see it. Um, and I'd respectfully ask that the phase two contingency that accompanied this approval, approval be removed and that an approval is granted tonight based on our intended use of the property under the zone. And, um, and that we proceed forward. Um, we do, and as I've mentioned, we do have a phase two that's halfway completed, and uh, we have all intentions of taking that to full completion and then making our decision of moving forward or not. If you see us moving forward, you're going to have a copy of the report. If you see us not moving forward, we're pulling our application or our approvals. We're not doing anything there. So uh, it's important to us to understand if we are approved here this evening, and uh, we are under time constraints with uh, many facets of our contract, and uh, it's important for us to understand where we stand. So I'm open for any other questions that somebody might have. <clears throat> so are there any initial questions, comments? Ms. Snow? Would you clarify, you do not yet own the property? That is correct, uh, ma'am. We are under a purchase and sales agreement. That's correct. Yep. And the current, the phase two of my question, um, the, I'm sorry, Ms. Snow, were you, were you done with your question? Thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, so with this phase two environmental study, if it turns out that you're forced to do remediation that exceeds your initial investment, you're not going to move forward with the purchase of the property? If we look at a phase, uh, remediation uh, schedule with this report, that doesn't meet to our satisfaction. I'm not saying it has to exceed, or if we find that it's too expensive, in whether it's a formula based on the value of the property, anticipated value, or what have you, if we see a remediation issue that we don't like, we're not moving forward. We have that ability in our report, I mean, in our uh, purchase agreement. So if we move forward, uh, we're happy to give you the report and say, here's what we've got. Um, it's clean, we're moving forward. If we have a report that says you gotta spend 20 grand to clean up some stuff, you know, something in that neighborhood, we, sure, let's move forward and here's the report. Have you, more than welcome to share it with you. Um, if we move forward and, and purchase the property and, and go ahead and occupy it and do the use that we intend to do there. Um, but I have a hard time going through the process now. I'm, I'm at the point where I'm gonna be spending thousands of dollars here and I don't even know if I can do an auction center up there properly. I'm worried about any other concerns that may come up uh, through the board or any other contingencies that may be placed upon me. And so it, 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 it bothers me. I do understand that I may have a remediation program within the report that could have uh, some, uh, you, you may view it differently than DEP views it, okay? And we need to resolve that issue. Um, but again, remember, we'd be working under the guises of DEP and uh, in their in their uh, their whole process and mission statement and so forth. So, uh, I guess where I'm coming from is uh, it leaves uncertainty right now the way this is being presented to us without having a full approval. We don't particularly know if we can do what we want to do, and is somebody going to put another contingency out there outside of an, an environmental concern, and that that concerns us. Okay, Are so. Comments and questions, Mr. Frowling? Um, on the PSA, um, you've got uh, the Clause 12 is an environmental site assessment is um, <clears throat> to be completed within 60 days of the agreement, which <laughs> on or about October 28th or something like that. What's the progress on that in the site assessment that, that's being done? Um, the uh, holes, of, holes in site borings have been marked and will be drilled next Tuesday. Uh, 
they were shot down on labs they're all backed up everywhere in the state however they were fortunate to find a lab yesterday so we're on track and can stay within the time frame of our contract so that was very good news to us here today uh, so it's about halfway done uh, in my mind um, and they are uh, uh, like I say, drilling next week and taking samples. And nothing's come up in the preliminary site review or in the inspection that was done in order to determine the boring sites? In order to determine what? The, the, the drill sites, sorry. The, the oh, no, uh, not at all. Uh, the, the, only the phase one has been conducted now, in which there were, uh, there were uh, flags that called for uh, a further study. The biggest flag being the Silver's Auto Garage or uh, Salvage Yard that was located yeah. next door with the B-Ram. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, they're right on track. Uh, one of the biggest things I'm learning as I go through this particular time frame with uh, environmental reports is just getting the scheduling together with the various vendors that they use. It's not very difficult. I'm in fact using the same, ven uh, the same environmental company that does work for the town of Scarborough and all your testings. I'm working with St. Germain. So maybe you've experienced that with them, uh, but they're telling us it's very difficult to operate right now and get things done. But they're getting it done within our time frame, so we're pleased. That's no, we're, we're seeing that everywhere and everywhere on sort of uh, uh, third-party reviews and third-party inspection processes, mm -hmm. not just for the zoning board, for other things, so yeah. understood. Yeah. The other thing um, is, have they begun the removal or have they, has, has Goldstein started the removal or started the, um, the, the, the clean out of the, of the property yet? For, not yet. Okay. Um, I, I understand that it's under PSA contingency, so they may not have. But well, they may not, yeah. They yeah. want to make sure I can do what I need to do there and Correct, those yeah. sorts of things. Um, the, there may be a possibility where um, we would assist Mr. Dumond in auctioning off those items to get sure, them yeah. out of there. Um, or, quite frankly, Mr. Dumond could call up a scrap dealer and at yep. the price of scrap on a given day, sell everything and it'd be gone in, within two days. It's yep. just that simple. Um, I'm thinking him. more of some of the, the, the and I'm not sure what's there today, but the, 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 um, the scrap auto stuff, the, the, and in particular, the, the contaminant products, the batteries, the, the, the fluids that are drained from the, 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 the scrap. The, 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 those None of that takes place on this site. Okay, got it. There is not a used battery there uh, from automobile uh, at all. Uh, there are no automobiles on the site that are uh, carcassed and used for parts uh, in, in, uh, for so resale. So this is pure chop. Uh, essentially this is pure stock steel, uh, scrap steel, steel that might come from uh, uh, leftover supplies at BIW. Cut short steel, yeah. they, they cut 20 pieces and it was too short. Doesn't meet the testing and hardness. Yeah. And so he buys that type of product from around New England. And he buys new steel from, from vendors as well. Yeah. Um, but he also buys shelving, uh, warehouse shelving of heavy gauge and, and cuts it and sells yeah. it. And so. Uh, there, it operates under a junkyard automobile permit, graveyard permit. That's how it does operate now, but as a permit, but only as scrap steel, and that's all he's done there. Got it. Okay, yeah. understood. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, yeah, you're welcome. <clears throat> Do you have any concern about, um, I'll say the the current uh, the current material that's currently stored there on site and its potential for environmental contamination? I asked that same question. I think what everybody wonders is, geez, the ground's all rusty. Is there a problem there? Um, there has not been a problem, and I was informed by our soil scientists that <clears throat> it looks bad, but it's iron, and that's prevalent throughout the state. Um, what would be of a concern is something you might not see. Was there some solvent or something on steel to keep it from rusting at some other place in an indoor location and it's now washed off under the ground and that type of thing. But overall, no, not concerned about the soil. But I want to find out. And that's why we've spent the 20 grand here to have our, our and that's, study done. That's know. the phase two environmental That's study. the phase two, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, it's easy to hear it, but I want to I want to be assured and have the test and the lab results back to back it up. So Great. that's what we're doing now. Yeah, go ahead. Although I think it's a question for the board. Do we have the authority to remove a contingency that the planning board placed? Because I know you had said that you were looking for that to be removed by us, but I it's under the assumption that we don't have that authority. 
Uh, no, we I could be wrong. We uh, <laughs> we have a recommendation from the planning board, and they have they have recommended a uh, condition that be placed on this. Should we vote to approve this appeal, um, we can. Uh, I'll say politely disagree with the planning board and choose to not include this if we if we uh, um, if we wish, or we can also uh, choose to vote down this appeal, even though the planning board has it, given it a favorable recommendation. However, in any case, we have to provide uh, clear findings of fact and uh, stated reasons for why we are doing so. And that's our that's our contingency. Yep, no worries, uh, Miss Snow. I have a couple of questions for James and Brian, maybe. Go ahead. <clears throat> I, um, I haven't seen a petition that was not by the owner of a property. I'm sorry? I've never seen a petition come in that the owner, uh, the um, petitioner didn't own the property. A, a, valid, oh, in the, in the, yeah, yeah. a valid purchase and sales agreement gives them the right title and Is interest sufficient. that allows them to apply for because in many cases like this one, someone doesn't want to occupy that property until they've found out whether or not they can get board approval to do what they want to do. And obviously, if they don't get board approval, that purchase and sales agreement will likely go away in, in most cases. So does our approval go with the land or with the petitioner? It goes with the this application and the petitioner. I don't believe our, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but if uh, this gentleman were to step back from this project and someone else were to take up the reins on it and apply again, they would have to go through the same process again. Is that correct, Brian? Um, no, not, not exact. Um, if if Keenan Auction were, let's just say in the future, to be bought out by another auction company, okay, and they wanted to do exactly what Keenan Auction was doing, that miscellaneous appeal would actually run with the land in that case. However, if Keenan Auction or, or Big, Big Mountain Realty sometime in the future said, we no longer have a use for this site, we've got other plans, and they wanted to sell it to someone else who wanted to do another non-conforming use that wasn't this, they would be back here in front of the board to, with their own miscellaneous appeal application uh, to do that particular non-conforming use, and we would review the same standards again to see if they met But those. anyone with this use would have this approval? If they did exactly the same thing, yes. They'd still need to get a new certificate of occupancy to be on the property so we knew exactly who was on the property. But if, if the use did not change, they could so Goldstein Steel could sell to another steel company and could operate in exactly the same way that they do. If they were to expand that use or change that use in any way, they would have to come back uh, for approval from the board. Thank you. And, but we'll, so once, if we ap approve this application and the auction house is able to operate there, in the future, any future um, auction houses could also operate in a very similar fashion, even if it were with a different owner. Mm -hmm. Because we've granted them the ability to, to operate the this specific operation there. Thank you very much. Yep. Could Questions? Make, yeah, go ahead, sir. Could I make an additional comment? That, as I've been looking at this whole process from a bird's eye view, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the Silver's Auto Garage operated on the adjoining site since the 1950s. Um, the Goldstein Steel Company came in, and then later Danny Dumont came in, and they operated their um, their steel business, which basically is doing steel. Um, the Redbrook Watershed's been budding this for eternity. And the neighbor next door with the storage facility, which, mind you, is now a gorgeous storage facility, it looks really nice, um, has done the right things. And we're out here, we're doing the right things. I think one of the biggest reasons, and this is just my personal opinion, the planning board gave us this uh, con um, condition, was they're concerned about the Red Brook area. And I think that concern um, has just been heightened because of our application. The Red Brook's been there. Danny Dumont's been operating for decades, decades and decades. And along comes Keenan, and here we are, and now, oh boy, we got to really have everybody do environmental stuff now. My point that I guess I'm making is there haven't been complaints, there haven't been problems down there. 
but maybe the focus should be more on the Redbrook property and on the site where they do have the control and the immediate uh, authority to go down there and do some testing to see if there are problems with that Redbrook preserve and are there anything, you know, are there contaminants there? Because that's really the main concern. And obviously the health and welfare of the people occupying this property and any other property, but I know the wells have tested out okay up there. And there's been, you know, that's what I'm being told. And uh, But it, that's one of the things I'm thinking about is maybe going right straight to the source of concern. Um, and just, just my simple opinion as I look at this from a bird's eye view. Yeah. We're concerned and we're good stewards, but uh, we need to understand where we stand, you know. No, and I, and I appreciate that. And I mean, for, you know, environmental concerns are very, um, they're, they're serious considerations. And, and, time, and any time they come up, we have to, you know, we got to look at them, them yep. seriously, especially with, you know, I guess my, following that up, what kind of equipment would you be storing outside um, and what like, kind of equipment would be stored inside? Okay, uh, good question. Um, the type of equipment that we have in our business use, meaning the stuff I use day to day in our company operation, I like landscape trailers, of uh, office trailer that we use maybe two or three times a year on off-site sales. Um, a, a forklift may go inside the building. It's a propane type forklift. It's not a gas job. Um, a plow truck, uh, normal business type uh, items. A client who comes to us that uh, needs an item sold in an upcoming timed online auction, needs it removed out of a facility due to an expiring lease or something, I'm painting us some pictures for you, uh, we'd go pick up a commercial dishwasher and put it inside the building. Uh, it could be uh, the other day we picked up two uh, um, uh, Botox machines, you know, it's just, you name it. it. It really is odd and obscure type stuff and sometimes it's just normal assets that you see every day. But not at any great degree of volume. Um, our best model is to sell items in place where they exist, uh, not to move them and create labor and expense. We're not talking about um, uh, putting over here hundreds of items all the time. That's not our, uh, we just don't have room in our small parking lot over at uh, Congress Street. Uh, we just, it's not there. Um, so we also have a couple of storage trailers that we sometimes would put file storage in and that sort of thing. Um, might have a four-wheeler and a snowmobile. It's just, I guess, um, you'd be amazed at what we sell. Uh, sure. So, uh, but primarily, it's a lot of the time it's rolling stock. I sell all the town cop cars for the town of Scarborough, and I might store those if you needed space, that type of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's really what we're looking at. So I guess, I guess, going a little bit, just a little bit deeper with that, um, sure. would you potentially be storing? Um, any any sort of vehicles out there, tractors, farm equipment, uh, and if it's if it's it that could. if it's an auction and they're not brand new, if they're older, uh, do you have any sort of control if like, we do. somebody uh, brings in and there's like a leak or an oil? Yeah, leak? That, we discussed and, and this I'm last thing. Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking about and I didn't great question I know, and I, you good know, I concern. That. I didn't watch the planning board meeting last. Yeah, night, but. and a good concern. I'll give you a prime example. <clears throat> if you were to go out to Beechwood's Motor Speedway right now, if you're not familiar, we have a large consignment sale that we'll be doing there tomorrow. That's about a nine and a half acre parcel in the parking lot that we utilize. I'll have 500 people there tomorrow, tons of cars. Um, and I've got over almost a thousand items that are stored there now. And it's, in, it's brand new items that come out of Ontario, um, brand new pressure washers, steam cleaners, cars, um, municipal cars, uh, police cruisers. When they come in leaking, okay, we inform people we won't take leaking vehicles. We, don't, we won't take them. Um, but if they happen to start leaking, I have spill pads and preventive pans and that sort of thing, what we put under a vehicle. Um, we check these items. We look at them. You can tell when they come in. You know what you're dealing with. We look them over. Um, we don't take the liability. If we can get away from it, we do. Uh, the one-off vehicles that I'd store over on this lot, are not, a lot of times they're bank repossessions. Banks don't store this stuff. They have people store it for them, and that's what we do. A lot of times municipalities can hold them in their own public works garages, and it's just sale day that they may bring them over. So it's really short-term storage. Um, but we do take a lot of measure and precaution on looking at these vehicles and a skitter that comes in. We check hydraulic lines. Um, 
we've mentioned, I mentioned earlier in my mark, remarks that we've done over 8,500 auctions, and of those, about a third of those auctions have been personal property. And in the 50 years we've been doing this, we've never had an environmental incident at one of our auctions or at one of our properties. We've cleaned up properties we bought that were dirty, but we've never had an environmental incident. We've had to use our absorbent pads before, but nothing at a reporting level that DEP would require a report on. So we don't have those types of, uh, that type of history for our company. Um, it's too much liability, and I'm working for a, a client that's a bank and a lender, so we've got to protect their interests as well. So we're very good at it. Um, that's what we do. So. Okay. Yeah. Questions? Mr. Bork? How many auctions would you be doing on site at the Rolling Hill location? Uh, good question. I can't think of the last on-site auction I did at one of our remote storage facilities. Uh, we have one up in Kingfield, and we had one over in South Portland at our other facility uh, that I've done on a live auction basis, I'm talking. In the past 10 years, I've maybe done one in the past 10 years. What I would do a lot of, or maybe a lot of, I say a, maybe because I, I could maybe develop a pipeline where I put 20 items out there and I sell them every two weeks or I sell them every month or maybe every two months on a timed online basis, which is very, very different than a live on-site auction. Um, in the timed online auction process, uh, there are a lot of similarities to the live process in terms of setup, cataloging, photography, um, removal, and that sort of thing. What's very different is impact on the site. Um, it's funny, in today's world, a lot of people buy stuff online and don't even look at it. They don't even go see it, and you may experience that yourself. Um, but people will buy cars from us online and drive from Ohio and pick them up and take them home. It's crazy. I sent a microwave to Chicago. They never looked at it. So <laughs> it's really crazy stuff. Why I tell you this is because I may be storing the asset there, but I, and I'll have a preview for the market to come in and look at the asset if they want. I give them an option to look at it. And I do it like for an hour from 8 to 9 or 10 to 11 or maybe 10 to 12 if I have a bunch of items. And they don't, uh, they, they come over and they look at it, low impact. Uh, I mentioned to the planning board last night that if I had a large uh, gathering of items there, I might have five to 20 people show up and look at it. And that would be a lot. Um, what I deal with then is not trying to cram everybody into a restaurant down in, uh, that I'm auctioning off down in the old port and wonder where they're all gonna park. There's nothing like that. They're now gonna look at it all online, their bid, and they drive over here on the day to pick up the items, and I'm only dealing with buyers. I'm not in movers. I'm not dealing with tire kickers, hot dog eaters, and people trying to socialize at an auction, which happens a lot. Um, I'm dealing just with buyers. So the impact's really low, and I'll do some of those kinds of sales, but live auctions, rarely. Um, I have customers, though, that are old school and aren't into this new internet thing, as they say, and they want us to do a live sale. and We've been put in wills, and they've asked us to do that. So I have to be able to service my clients, so I look to try and... I can't do a big sale there. It's just, it just doesn't work. There's not enough room. Okay. So, a follow-up to that. Uh, can you control when customers come to your site? By my timing, yes. yes. Um, yes. And I do want to keep the fencing gate. So there's a gate, and when I'm not there, it's locked. Um, when we are holding a preview, for instance, it's an advertised preview, and people know what times to come. When we sell items on one day, and the next day they come to pick them up, we have a scheduled time when they come and pick things up, and that's advertised. And we're strict, too. Um, time's money, and we don't hang out all day to come get your item. We, we do it. Uh, we give them a time frame for them to come and, and pick things up. Okay. So, uh, as yes, you know, Running Hill Road is a busy road during rush hour? Yeah, uh, in, the, in the early in morning and evening rush hour. In late uh, afternoon. Would you yeah. avoid those times? Yeah. Um, we normally would do a preview on a set of items or a removal, I should say, at 8 o'clock um, till, say, noon. No, um, no, we do no, that in... Hour, I hear you. Um, I do it on, on auctions that I do in Congress Street, on on-site sales. I do it in, uh, in many high-profile locations. Um, we're talking about 
uh, removal periods that maybe start at 8 o'clock and run till noon, we might be expecting 30 people, so we might see five people show up at 8 o'clock, which that would not be a burden on the rush hour. Um, and quite frankly, uh, uh, I don't see big impacts of time. If it becomes a problem, again, I've never had an issue in 50 years, and I went to the first auction. So my point is, is uh, if we see problems, we address them. Um, I do get into parking situations where there are, I need to have the police involved and I need to have signs and I need to do all of that. We're very cognizant of that. But if we see a detriment there, <coughs> we're going to address it for sure. But I don't see it. It just doesn't, I don't get waves of people at 8 o'clock in the morning, I, even though I offer that timing. And you can still control the time that people come in? <clears throat> sure can. Yes, you can. Yeah. You. yeah, we can. Yeah, probably you had a question. Um, yeah, it, it relates to the, uh, the, the the phase two study that you're that you're um, doing. And um, f first off, just um, a, a, maybe to assuage your concerns, um, the, the the town, due to changes in state and federal regulation, is now much more concerned on all of our at risk watersheds. So I think you might just be encountering an issue from a timing perspective not so much your property in particular or the Red Brook in particular. It's, it's the, the, um, all of our at-risk watersheds are now being more heavily scrutinized and we're required to look at a number of our things, including setback requirements and otherwise. So mm -hmm. just wanted to let you know it's not, it's not okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, uh, perfect timing. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, on that basis, you're, you're going to continue and, and complete the phase two no matter what. You're, 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 you're going to complete the drillings. You're going to complete the, the site assessment. Yes. Yeah, yeah okay. we're, we're moving forward with that. Uh, uh, unless something out of a left field comes and the property's destroyed. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, if you, if you come pull, up with pull all back these from PSA entirely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, right. but assuming but, but, that we continue. Uh, our intent is to buy this property. I need space. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Okay. That's all. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> you got it. I have a question. Can you clarify for me again um, why you do like to have Thank you, Brian. Hey, could you clarify for me one more time uh, why you would like to have the contingency of, or the, con the condition, rather, of the phase two environmental study removed from any uh, approval we would have on this? Why? It holds up my approval. I'm not approved. So what I'm worried about is what other conditions could you put in before I am approved? And it, to me, um, I have uncertainty and un uh, it's unclear. Um, and so uh, I, I find it hard to move forward if I don't know if I'm approved. And I'm spending lots of money now. I'm, uh, the, the drill on the wells next week. I'm on phase two of my reports. And I don't even know if I can do it here. Um, and that, that's one of my biggest concerns. So we've, uh, they're drilling next week and they're moving forward, but I don't even have an approval. And it's unfortunate for me. If we were to approve it, though, and include the condition that this is approved pending the outcome of this phase two environmental study, would you still be able to proceed forward with this project? Am I approved? If we approve your, if we approve mm -hmm. your appeal under the condition that the phase two environmental study um, suits your outcome, would you still be able to move forward? If I could be assured I wouldn't have any other contingencies put into my approval, well, I guess we'll have to wait and find out. <laughs> you follow me? I don't mind, uh, like I said, if there's a dirty spot here, the, the phase two is going to speak for itself. Am I right? Um, and so if I'm moving forward with the deal, okay, I don't have any trouble showing you my report and having the town be a partner with me to look at my report and move forward. I don't have any problem with that. But I don't know right now if I'm approved. I don't know what else is going to be thrown at me. Last night I was told I was approved with a, um, uh, uh, an approval based upon um, uh, the Conservation Commission looking at this. And then it changed, unbeknownst to me, to this, today to an environmental sharing of the report. Fine, I like that. I'm happy to be a, a partner with you folks and move forward. But what else am I going to see? And I've got thousands of dollars into this, tens of thousands of dollars into this already and more going next week. So I'm just concerned about getting an approval. And if I had assurances that there weren't going to be any other contingencies that come at me 
outside of environmental. I understand the environmental. We don't know what we're going to see in the report, and I'll work with everybody if we want to move forward. But I don't, outside of that environmental report, what else is coming at me? You follow yep. me? That's what I'm getting at. So. And I completely understand, and I, I empathize, and I understand. Yep. Um, I'll, we're not privy to what goes on outside of this room as far as what what else you are up against as yep. far as trying to move this forward but we're just looking we're just looking <laughs> just at this tonight um i'm going to pause for a moment and just going to read an email we received from uh, was this the only email that we received public comment that we received on this brian aren't you going to open public comment well i will okay. i will once i, I once i have your answer i suppose i should i'll open this for public <laughs> hearing now that I know this is the only email we have, are there other folks here that would like to speak on this uh, miscellaneous appeal application? Okay. I'm going to read this email. This was received um, from <clears throat> Ronald Blanchard. Uh, good afternoon, Brian. Uh, years ago, 36 Running Hill Road, Goldsteins, disassembled airplanes and transformers on their property. After a few years, they pushed the hazardous material over to 32 Running Hill Road, which I ended up purchasing. It had contaminated soil, and I spent around $500,000 to remediate and encapsulate per the EPA and the state of Maine. It stands to reason that 36 Running Hill Road has contaminated soil, even though some of it was moved to 32 Running Hill Road. If there is an expectation of paving the land at 36 Running Hill Road, it is an absolute mud zone when it rains, therefore it would require wastewater management. I had quite a sum of money. Of, I had a quite a sum of money to build a holding pond and drainage systems, and the town spent a lot of money cleaning Red Brook. Water draining from the site had to be monitored and controlled. Uh, what is meant by a small storage facility? Are they referring to the steel building on the site that is used as a warehouse for a few items? Since Scarborough does not have a sanitary sewer system, would this require a septic system to be installed if anyone if anyone is on site during the day? I would assume if it was going to be a small storage facility, they would have to pave the land. Um, so I guess we we'll respond to that. Do you have any intention of, of paving any of the property? No, and I talked with our soil scientist about it, and I asked, because I was concerned about runoff and so forth as it related to uh, the um, uh, any potential oils and contaminants, and I, I asked him, he says it's actually better off the way it is. He says you have compacted soil that is impervious. He says water is going to run off the top of this soil very easily. He says it's not, he, this has been packed soil for decades and decades. Um, so from an environmental standpoint, he looked at it and said, um, I don't think you're any better off putting uh, pavement on here uh, then you are to go with what you have for soils. He said, now, if we find something in the ground, it could change all of that. There might be an encapsulation issue to look at and that sort of thing. But as it exists, if you're just worried about uh, runoff, he says, in fact, paving the property is going to create a stronger runoff towards Red Brook. Um, I hear the email that I'm reading, and I, I have pictures from 1991 on the day that uh, Mr. Blanchard removed all the soils from his property. Uh, they were not all soils that were put there by Danny Dumont. Um, I know that there had been lawsuits between the two parties and on and on. Um, I have pictures of, uh, oh, probably about 15 to 20 pictures of soils that were existing on Mr. Blanchard's site and soils that were moved over and, and buried over in Scarborough um, at another facility over at uh, next to Scarborough Auto Parts. Um, Mr. Dumont and in court testified that uh, under oath that he pushed uh, tires onto uh, Mr. Blanchard's property. Uh, the Blanchard's property um, uh, in their use of their property before Mr. Blanchard brought it had encroached on Mr. Dumont for tires and stuff. So he pushed tires back. And there was a theft issue and so forth uh, about metals and on and on. But the long and the short was uh, Mr. Dumont testified in court that he didn't push and pile up contaminated soils per se. Uh, it was mostly tires. And they have the pictures of the tires and all of his records. So I'm, I'm telling you what I've heard from him. I don't know what happened, but that's what I was told. So there's all kinds of stuff floating around on that. But what I do know is a VRAP was done, and um, we're looking at it, and we're doing our environmental studies, and we're concerned. Yep. 
Yeah. So that, we get it. Yeah. And that and that phase two environmental study will give you the indication of where the VRAP is and if they're not. Oh one is yeah, yeah. Are. Yes, it will. Um, without question, um, I've looked at the phase two reports associated with the Blanchard property in the phase two and and where the contaminant sites were and the drilling and and all of that and and my environmental uh, people at St. Germain have reviewed those reports as well. So they've got a full, I've got four different soils scientists looking at this property now uh, and from various different levels. And so we're doing a thorough job. We, again, <laughs> I, I bought a property, or our family bought a property at Exit 8 and a half a million dollars later, we finally closed. Okay. When we got to the main turnpike, it stopped. And so our eyes are wide open here. We're not buying this property if it's dirty, and we understand Mr. Blanchard and his concerns, and I'm, I'm, I get it. All right. Thank you. So, yep. Other questions or comments? Go ahead. I just want to comment just to be transparent. Um, I carefully listen to what you've had to say. Thank you. And I trust that you are interested in protecting the environment. And, uh, I would not be comfortable um, eliminating the planning board's condition. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know that. Okay, that's fine. We're not friends anymore. Okay. <laughs> just kidding. Mr. Chair. Yes. <clears throat> just uh, I'll make a similar uh, a comment, but uh, with a slightly different outcome. Uh, the planning board has already put this condition on. Um, it's not necessary for us to rule on that condition one way or the other. Uh, you're already in the process of doing the environmental impact study, and one way or another, you'll know what the outcome is. Mm -hmm. uh, we would, I don't think it's necessary for us to be redundant and to state this as a condition in our findings. You know, our role is, as a Zoning Board of Appeals is to decide whether or not uh, this site uh, is approved for the use that you want to use it for. I agree. You know, which is different than what it's currently being used for, mm -hmm. and that's it. Um, if we want to place additional uh, restrictions on it, mm -hmm. fine. Okay, yeah. but this the condition that it was placed on by the zoning by the planning board uh, isn't anything that we necessarily have to do anything about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's the way I interpret it. Thank you. Okay. All right, so right now what we're going to do is go into the different questions here. I know we've gone to great length for a discussion. Right now we'll close the public hearing. Um, so I know we've gone through and discussed this at length, but what we're going to do is go through each of the criteria. You can just read your answers back in for the record. So oh. letter A. Do you mind if I follow along with you? Of course. Yeah. I can have that with me. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, yeah. So for the board, we'll be looking at uh, letters A through le letters A through I for the miscellaneous appeal. Uh, letter A. Uh, I'm okay. oh, sorry. I'll give you a moment. I apologize. Yep. Don't mean to rush you. No worries. Looking at the addendum to Big Mountain Realty Trust miscellaneous appeal. Yes, there should be like uh, so. Our first one, letter A. It's got it up on the okay. All right. Yeah, I'm not seeing that here. The first one. Oh, is, there. Um, yeah, the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or okay, operation. Right. I'm with it's you. That section we're going to start. Yeah, with. I'm back there now. Okay. Yep. All right. So, letter A: the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of design or operation. And you can what you can just read your answers right. Yeah, uh, the storage of the auction items and the sale of said items will not create unhealthy conditions. And uh, 
they won't emit pollution or air into the water. They won't. Uh, there's no septic system there, but we do in, uh, tend to put a small septic system for commercial use in the bathroom, um, or a well, I should say. Um, and, of course, we'll follow the local codes for that. Okay. Letter B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Um, the small and isolated auction events will generally have low attendance um, and they uh, will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions. <clears throat> Letter C. Uh, the proposed use will not create public safety problems which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. Yes. Um, and as we've stated here in the previous section, the proposed use will have less of an intrusive effect in the neighborhood than current use by Goldstein Steel. There'll be no cutting of scrap steel or torches or shears, which is currently allowed on site. And uh, therefore, the proposed use would not require any more fire or police protection, and indeed would likely require less. Um, and by the way, we are compliant with fire stuff uh, and so forth. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Letter D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. Uh, nothing to be stored on the site or sold at auction will lead to sedimentation or erosion or will have an adverse effect on water supplies. Letter E, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Um, that proposed use will generally mirror the existing use in terms of size, uh, proximity to other structures, and density of development. However, the intensity of use and the visual impact will likely be a great improvement as the proposed use will be for the storage of and sale of auction items rather than an automobile graveyard, scrap steel, and the like. If located in a shoreland zone, I guess, is this located in a shoreland zone? No, it is not. All right, we can proceed to letter G. The applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. Uh, the trust has secured a purchase and sale agreement to purchase the property located at 36 Running Hill Road in Scarborough and intends to lease the property to the company. The trust will have sufficient right, title, and or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. Letter H, the applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of the section. Yes, the trust and company have the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section as well as to comply with any condition imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to section 4-1-5 of the ordinance as set forth in section 415 of the ordinance. Such conditions may include but are not limited to specific for a type of vegetation, increased setback in yards, specified sewage disposal and water supply facilities, landscaping and planning screens, hours of operation, operation controls, professional inspection and maintenance, sureties, locations of piers, docks, parking and signs, and types of construction. Letter I, uh, the proposed use will be compatible with existing conditions in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation. I guess could you reiterate your hours of operation? Yeah, there will be no additional <coughs> generation of noise from the subject property site and the proposed use will be compatible with the existing uses in the neighborhood. Uh, hours of operation um, on uh, checkout days, uh, typically 8 o'clock until 2 um, on uh, we'll check out days when people come and pick up items that they purchase should we have a sale uh, online there and then um, uh, drop off periods could be throughout the day uh, uh, typically use would be a normal 8 to 5 business day but we may not go to the site for a week it's, it, it, or a month. It, it really is, is going to be haphazard, but it would be during normal business hours. I'm not going to say we won't go pick up a plow truck at 9 o'clock at night to go plow, um, you know, so the to normal business hours. Good enough. Thank you. You're welcome. I guess at this point, any questions or additional comments from board members? Okay. And what we're going to do, we've already gone through the public comment. What we're going to do is deliberate amongst ourselves and the board. If we have further questions for you, we will ask. All right. Uh, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, 
Let's go through for the first one here, and we'll go through one by one, then we'll all vote at the, uh, after discussing each, um, each point. The proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or operation. Now I'm going to look to you, uh, Mr. Freilinger. I think the applicant has shown that, that, that they've met the requirements for this particular item. Um, and I think we need to view it in, in, in particular with respect to number one, the phase two study that they're, um, they're currently conducting, and number two, the current use of the property. Um, the current use of the property um, likely has higher risk um, for this, and the, and the proposed use um, mitigates the risks associated with the, uh, the scrapyard currently on site. Um, so I think they've they've met this and uh, and and we should feel comfortable moving forward. I agree, Mr. Bo uh, Mr. Bork. <clears throat> no further comments. Okay, uh, Ms. Uh, Stevenson. I have nothing further to add. Uh, Ms. Snow. Nothing to add. Okay, uh, as Mr. Freilinger said, the applicant is conducting a phase one and two environmental assessment uh, to determine the existence of any kind of you know hazard material contamination in the soil. And the applicant has stated um, they will mitigate uh, any hazardous or contaminated situations or scenarios on the site uh, if it's financially feasible for them to purchase the property and go forward with it. Uh, but ultimately, this this um, this purchase and sale agreement is not going to go through if it's determined to not be financially feasible, and that will give us more than enough indication that there is significant contamination there uh, that they're not going to be looking to go. Uh, so that being said, all those in favor of letter A being met, please raise your hand. Okay, that is unanimous. Uh, letter B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to existing and for tree or foreseeable traffic in its facility, uh, vicinity. Excuse me. And I'm going to start down here uh, with you, Ms. Snow. Uh, the applicant has indicated that there will be minimal vehicle trips generated from the proposed use. There will be low attendance auctions or drop-offs or pickups. The site is large enough to allow vehicles to enter and turn around, so there's no backing out onto Running Hill Road, and it should be adequate. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Stevenson. Nothing further to add. Okay. Mr. Bork. Uh, the applicant has indicated that um, he has the ability to control the time of the day that applicants, uh, buyers, excuse me, uh, will uh, come to the site to uh, pick up uh, their auction materials. Thank you. Mr. Freilinger? I think part of this, too, is uh, it, it's relative to existing, including the Goldstein properties um, use and foreseeable traffic in the facility, vicinity. The existing Goldstein facility also has normal business hours, including in um, drop-offs and pickups during both uh, normal and rush hour time. So um, relative to that, there's no, um, no change in, in traffic. Uh, I think he's met the, uh, the requirements of this one. I'll add as well uh, that he's proposing to have general hours um, from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. And so at least they're dodging the, the, the rush hour at the end of the day. Uh, and so again, you know, I don't think it's a real substantial amount of traffic that's going to be going into here. Um, the applicant has stated that uh, equipment that is being auctioned and purchased are meant for people to be going onto the property and receiving uh, the said products and, re and leaving the vicinity with them, not really meant for uh, window shopping, so to speak, uh, and so folks to stop and buy or anything like that. Uh, that being said, all those in favor of letter B being met, please raise your hand. Okay, that is unanimous. Thank you. Letter C, the proposed use will not create public safety problems, which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially, uh, substantially greater degree in municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. Mr. Freilinger. I uh, agree. Uh, again, I don't think there's anything that's come up in the application or in the discussions today that would indicate this hasn't been met. And as the applicant notes, there will not be cutting torches or um, sort of high risk uh, industrial equipment on site other than um, uh, equipment being sold. So I think uh, this one is adequately met. Thank you, Mr. Bork. Uh, the applicant also has an excellent record of public safety over many, many years. Uh, and there's no reason to believe that uh, that won't continue. Ms. Stevenson? No comments. Ms. Snow? Nothing further. 
Yeah, uh, the, the applicant is, uh, for my, my bit, the applicant has uh, stated uh, more than once that they don't anticipate any um, additional fire or uh, police protection here. And again, as you pointed out, Mr. Freilinger, they're not doing any um, sort of high-risk uh, operations here. Uh, that being said, all those finding letter C in compliance, please raise your hand. Okay, that is unanimous. Uh, letter D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. Uh, I will start with you, Ms. Snow. The applicant does not intend to pave the existing gravel or earth material, which is already compacted, and um, it sh there should not be any further impact to the water supply. Okay. Ms. Stevenson? No extra comments. Mr. Bork? Uh, the location is in an aquifer uh, protection overlay zone. Mr. Frylinger? Uh, I, I, again, I think the applicant has indicated that they're not going to pave the, the surface, which I think is a positive. Um, we generally speaking would view hardscape as being a, a, a detriment to the water supply as opposed to keeping uh, compacted soils in place. And they're also, uh, uh, again, the phase one and phase two um, remediation or, or phase one and phase two um, environmental study um, will indicate whether there are issues to be addressed. And, uh, and the applicant has shown a willingness to, to take a look at that as both part of their PSA and part of their ongoing um, uh, ownership of the property. So no issues. Thank you. Uh, I'll add that, um, yes, they're, they're pending the outcome of this phase two environmental study to sort of see what the impact is existing on the property. Um, me personally for this, I, I struggle with this one only because you know, we're continuing in unconforming, a non-conforming use. Um, in this space, which, if it were, if if the gold scenes weren't originally there, would we allow this business to go into that location? Um, that's that's my only concern about it. Will but will the proposed use result in sedimentation or erosion, or have an adverse effect on water supplies? Um, it, I don't I don't believe so. Um, the applicant has stated that. They have a uh, cleanup uh, procedure in place where they inspect vehicles or engines that come in uh, for any sort of oil leaks or things like that. Um, so that is, that is obviously something that you know, uh, is, is very positive for this particular comment. Um, all those in favor of letter D being Mr. Chairman, that. Yes, I, go ahead. Can I add something for that? For that? I think we should look, the, the property next to it is a, a storage facility. Um, a, a, a you store it facility essentially, but it's still a storage facility, um, and it's hardscaped. So, um, and, and I think most of uh, I'll, I'll I'll posit this. I, it's up for discussion, obviously, but um, I, I think the town is comfortable with that use, and to have um, a similar storage use without hardscape would probably be something that would that would pass muster for us, given, the, 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 given what Keenan has in terms of its history of, of, of property stewardship, et cetera. So um, I hear, you, hear what you're saying. Like Non-conforming uses are always sort of something we've got to consider. Hmm. But I think in, in, the, in the, the scheme of this part of the RF district um, and what's been deemed as being OK in this, I think we probably would do that. So I, I'll just offer that as a, as a, as a, as a counterpoint. So. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of letter D being met, please raise your hand. Okay. Um, that's four. All those opposed, I will oppose this one. So that's 4-1. Uh, letter E, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Uh, I'll start with you, Mr. Freilinger. Again, relative to the use of the next door property and, uh, and, and relative to what's been there in the past and other properties on Running Hill Road, I think the applicant has demonstrated that this is in line with this part of the RF district. So uh, I, I, I concur on this one. All right. Thank you. Mr. Bork? I agree and nothing further to add. Ms. Stevenson? No further comments. Uh, Ms. Snow? Nothing further. Okay. Um, as you said, Mr. Freilinger, there is a compatible uh, nearly compatible uh, business directly adjacent to this property um, as far as uh, within the sphere of being compatible. Um, 
with respect to visible, visible, physical size and visual impact, uh, theoretically there will be less of a visual impact here because they'll be moving a lot of the, the scrap and junk cars that is going to be there now and ideally replacing them with um, uh, equipment that will be there very uh, sort of uh, transitory to use, to coin a phrase. Um, so all that being said, all those in favor of letter E being met, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Letter F, if located in a shoreland zone, is depicted on the Town of Scarborough official shoreland zoning map. Mr. Longstaff, can you confirm that this is not located within a shoreland zone? Mr. Chair, this is <coughs> not. This property is not in a shoreland zone. Okay. Well, does anyone have any further comment on that? Okay. Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of letter F being met as unanimous. Letter G, the applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. Uh, Ms. Snow. The applicant has supplied us with a purchase and sales agreement for the property. Very good. Ms. Stevenson. <coughs> Nothing further to add. Mr. Bork. Agreed. Uh, Mr. Farlinger. Agreed. Yeah, that's pretty straightforward here. The applicant has stated they have this purchase and sale agreement, which we have discussed earlier, is uh, um, uh, all the, um, the documentation they need in order to come before us and, and go through this appeals process. All those in favor of letter G being met, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Uh, letter H, the applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. Mr. Freilinger. Uh The Keenan Auction Company has indicated a long experience in this type of, uh, of business. Also indicated that they have uh, rem um, purchased and remediated and installed similar storage sites elsewhere in Maine with similar conditions. So yes, I believe they've demonstrated this. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bork. Uh, I think the applicant has provided ample evidence that, um, that they will comply with uh, the highest level of standards uh, in, in running their business. Ms. Stevenson? I agree with everything that's been said so far. Ms. Snow? Um, I'm still pondering this one because he is unaware if he can comply with the phase two remediation. So I don't. Um, I don't quite know how to hmm. square that. Sure, sure. <laughs> I, if I can offer some, some sure. insight there. I guess I welcome it. Looking from the perspective of, uh, coming from the perspective of his technical and financial ability to do that, uh, they certainly, I feel that they have proven that they have the financial and technical ability to do so, and that's going to inform their decision on whether or not to pursue this project. Um, for a cost benefit analysis, if there isn't a return on investment, that's enough for them to um, mitigate any upfront costs of, of the potential contamination in the space, they're not going to go through with it. Um, and with and if we maintain and uphold, if we uphold a condition that um, this is approved pending the outcome of phase two environmental study, and they do not go forward with the um, they do not go forward with the purchase of the property. That sort of signals a much um, deeper issue that the town may have to deal with. And where is that phase two? And, and these steps. Where is that phase two environmental? That condition. So that phase two environmental study is ongoing at the moment. Those results are. I, I can, uh, sorry, I don't understand. Go ahead, Brian. Um, so, so the place to impose conditions would be when you get to the actual decision. Right. So once you've gone through these these requirements and and you've done your your uh, your findings, and then and then somebody uh, makes a motion yeah. to approve, then they can add that condition in, and and just for some some perspective, and I don't pretend to know everything there is to know about a phase two. It's been about 100 years since I was involved in one uh, back up north with Steelstone Industries. <laughs> and we had a lot of buried underground fuel tanks that we had to remove, and that was when I got involved with it and thrown into the fire, so to speak. So it's been a while. But in, in listening to the applicant, and, and, and I did not attend the planning board meeting, but just on the face of this condition that they've put on their um, on their advisory opinion, it seems like it's just sort of a self 
self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will, because if the phase two, uh, it's already been stated, if the phase two shows a lot of problems, the applicant will walk away. Therefore, the approval of this miscellaneous appeal dies because they will not start their operation within six months of this approval. This approval is good for six months. Starting, starting that would be doing mitigation if they so chose to do that. And, then, and that, would, that would start, you know, if they undertook that any time within six months from now. That would, that would preserve their, their approval if you were to approve it. If they walk away, the approval dies. No harm done. The existing business is still there. Nothing changes. So it's curious the way the planning board put that condition in there because they just said pending the phase two approval, it's sort of open. So, so what? You get the phase two, two approval. The applicant said he'll share it with the town. Maybe the, maybe the condition should be sharing the phase two approval with the, with the town because they're either going to do the mitigation work or not. If they don't, the approval dies. If they do, the approval lives because they've chose to make that investment in the site. They can't operate unless they do the mitigation that the phase two requires, is my understanding. So, so I don't really know what the problem is. We can approve, or I would say we, the board, could approve this so it, if it so chose upon the condition that the phase two mitigation efforts are either undertaken and the use is established or the applicant walks away and the purchase and sales agreement dies and the use dies. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Lawrence. I, I, does, I don't know if that helps well, clear, yeah, clear it up. Most of that. <clears throat> I, guess, um, I, I really can't understand the applicant's concerns about having that condition or that's part of that. I think the applicant's mostly concerned with uh, additional conditions that we were to place on them that may have some financial or technical bearing on them. I can't, uh, at this point, um, we haven't really been discussing any of them. That Correct, and, and we have the ability to um, create additional conditions on this as well. Uh, and I guess the, their concern is that he doesn't know what additional consider uh, additional conditions that we would be uh, imposing here. We'll see what I do. Um, but usually there is something hinted at that at this point, but I, so I don't think that's likely to happen. But um, for, Ms., for your original question, I apologize, I wasn't understanding, but the, con the conditions are taken uh, up into account when we move on the, uh, on the approval. And I would Thank just add, Mr. Chair, if I could, if the board so chose to add any additional conditions when it got to that approval, the applicant has the ability to either meet those or not if they Again, if they choose not to meet those conditions or disagree with those conditions, they could certainly, the board could entertain a counter offer, if you will. That's a negotiation. Um, you could do that. I think the applicant's concern was, can they leave here tonight knowing they have an approval or not? That, that to me, is yep. really the bottom line. And, and I think my answer to that is, I think they can leave here knowing whether they have an approval or not. It's just a matter of coming up with whatever conditions the board may or may not choose to impose on that. Thank you, Brian. Mr. Fellinger? One final, and it, and it might not be relevant to this particular issue, but I, I, I want to raise it. If we weren't to approve this or if the owner walks away, the existing non-conforming use remains. So, and, and Goldstein um, will continue to, you know, pry apart cars and, and and store metals on the site and let them let, let, let stuff run off of them into the soils and all the rest so I, I don't want to no, do <laughs> I just don't want to lose sight that, that that you know there is an existing non-conforming use yeah exactly but there is a, there, there's a non existing non-conforming use and it is what it is so that's the only point I want to make so uh, seeing that um, all those in favor of letter H being met. That is unanimous. Uh, letter I, the last one. Uh, the proposed use will be compatible with the existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation. I'll start with you, Ms. Snow. Well, the applicant's proposal is a less intensive use than what's going on at the site. There'll be no additional noise. He has fewer hours of operation, and there's only occasional drop-offs and pickups. It's not on a daily basis. And um, 
says here he's willing to install more buffering if the town wishes it. All right. Ms. Stevenson? Uh, I'll just add that the hours of operation are reasonable within business hours um, with the maybe occasional exception. I would also add that the, uh, the bulk of uh, the actual auctioning will be online uh, as opposed to on site and uh, that's less um, intense than the existing use. Mr. Frelinger? Nothing further, nothing further to add. Great. Yeah, I'll reiterate what I mentioned earlier. His proposed uh, hours of operation, though not set in stone, they're looking at um, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Those are very reasonable business hours to maintain. Um, there's no, uh, I mean, generation of noise and hours of operation. They're not going to be, as you mentioned, they're not going to be taking cars apart or taking equipment apart and creating that sort of uh, ancillary noise associated with those types of operations here. It'll simply be moving equipment, bringing stuff in, and taking them out. All those in favor of letter I being met, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Okay. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve appeal number 2739. Uh, Mr. Bork? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, I would also like to entertain um, an amendment to this to apply the following condition. Uh, our approval uh, is pending the outcome of the phase two environmental study. Um, and providing that information, or the, providing the results of the environmental study to the town. Second. Excellent. Uh, all those in favor of that being uh, included? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I, I um, propose a slight modification to that and simply uh, pending the submission of the findings to the town. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah just, I, I, I like that a little bit better. That's a better because again, the uh, the phase two environmental study doesn't hold them to anything. It's to, for them just to make a decision whether or not they are going to go through with it or not. So thank you for clarifying that. Correct. Can you please restate that so that Brian can capture that more accurately? Yeah. So um, the, the, I would move for um, a condition that uh, the the approval be conditional on the receipt of the um, uh, completed phase one and phase two environmental study. Okay, I like that much better. Is there a second for that? Second. Mr. Bork, excellent. All those in favor, <laughs> please raise your hand. That's right. <laughs> yes, that is unanimous. Okay, so now we have the full motion. It's all put together here. Are there any further conditions or comments that we wish to add at this time? More conditions. More conditions. <laughs> um, all right, uh, seeing none, all those in favor of uh, appeal number uh, 2739 as currently presented, please raise your hands. That is four. Uh, four yes and one no. I am the one no because I did not agree with that one finding earlier. Uh, so the appeal passes. It is approved. Actually, Mr. Chairman, which one did you not agree with? I didn't notice that. I did not agree on uh, D. letter D with regard to sedimentation or erosion. Got it. Okay, just to, yeah. missed it. Sorry. Yep, no, it's okay. It's okay to agree to disagree. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, all right, we are going to move on to our last uh, appeal of the evening. This is, excuse me one moment, this is appeal number 2740, special exception, home occupation by Kelly and Tom Roth. This is 333 Broad Turn Road, assessor's map R005, lot 27A. Uh, and if there is someone here uh, representing that would love to come and talk about it, come on up to the podium. <coughs> excuse me. Good evening. My name is Tom Roth from 333 Broad Turn Road in Scarborough. And I think I'm way underprepared here, but I want to kind of just get a feel for what I need to do here. Okay. Uh, we, we own this property. It abuts the land trust, the Fuller Farm Land Trust. And so right now, we, we have a seaweed business here in Scarborough. We've been in business for about 17 years. And we use the property to dry seaweed on uh, in the fields. Not all of them, but in a section of the fields. We have about 280 drying tables in the field. And we put about 10,000 pounds of seaweed on a couple times a week. And we dry it out. Um, it's not poured on the tables where it's thick. It doesn't decompose. So there's no smell involved. And none of our neighbors have ever said anything. And we're in and out. Um, but we're thinking about shifting to using it for some campsites. 
uh, high-end tents, not just bring in your own tent and set it up. Um, so we'd like to put around seven units, seven tents on the property and make it more of a destination, not just, um, again, not just a, a, somebody come in and set up their tent and spend the night and, um, and then move on. There would be a three night minimum. And so, and there would only be four people allowed in each site. So the, prop, the, the two fields, and I apologize, I don't have anything. It looks like a three-year-old did that, and I kind of did. Um, <laughs> but we're, like I said, we're only looking for seven, seven, up to seven units now with a maximum of 12 if this all works out. The company we go through is called Tenter, and so they, they'll supply the tent. They'll set it up. Um, it comes with its own solar shower. It also comes with um, what they call a loo. So it's a portable toilet thing that they have um, in, in the tent. It's, um, it's insured by them. There's $4 million worth of insurance per tent. Mm -hmm. So it's highly insured. Um, and again, we're not looking for a bunch of college kids coming in and setting up a party and, and carrying on. We, um, our, our kind of goal is here is to give them many of amenities, right? Take them out on the boat and show them Casco Bay or the marshes of Scarborough. Uh, take them on a seaweed foraging trip where they could come back and dry their own seaweed on. And we get our customers asking and ask, I mean, all the time we take them out um, for just to show them what we do. So we thought, well, you know, maybe a chance to make a little extra income on these fields that have been sitting here empty for quite some time. Um, we, would, we would allow pets because we're right next to the land trust and there's nothing but people with the dogs. And, and um, we also would widen our driveway. It's only a driveway right now. We would make it a lane so that we could get a vehicle coming in and out so there's no bottleneck. You know, somebody's trying to go out, someone's trying to turn in. Um, and again, with only six or seven sites, um, I don't think it'll create any problems. Hours of operation, normal, you know, probably from eight to six, people coming and going. Um, I mean, of course, if they're gonna be out doing something on Old Orchard Beach and they come back at nine o'clock at night, that's fine. But uh, we would limit fires to be put out by 10 o'clock at night. And there would only be fire rings, no open fires, um, nothing like that. Um, bathrooms, we were considering like a porta potty, but then we found a little better solution, these composting toilets. Um, they seem very, the new thing. Um, we could use, use those so we don't have to put in a leach field uh, or a septic system. That's one of the things we'd like to avoid the first year or two of business. We don't, we don't know if this is going to take off or just, we, we don't have a clue. So I didn't really want to put a $25,000 septic system in and just find out that it's in there for no reason. Um, so that's why I'm at. So showers too, we, we would like to put in two showers. And with those, we would put in a leach field so the water could have a place, place to go. We had the soils tested on the entire property. It's around 10 acres. Uh, with, there's a house there but sits pretty far back. Um, so the house would be not in view. Well, you could see the house, but it would be pretty much away, quite a ways away from it, each, each tent site. Um, the tents will be on the tree lines, not seen from the road. Um, the only person, people will see it are the people that are walking on the land trust would have a view of a couple of the tents, but we're trying to keep them secluded. Um, water. We would like to run a water line from our, from our home down. And the water, of course, will you know, be tested. And um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, like I said, I'm, a, I'm pretty new at this. So that's kind of what we were planning on doing. And I leave it up to you guys to ask questions. OK. Do you have, um, <clears throat> and normally I'd like to see uh, uh, I guess you're, you're talking about a tent supplier, like a glamping tent exactly. supplier. Is this a franchise? Yes. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, so they've, uh, I guess what I would like to see um, is product information. Okay, Kelly, do we? Oh. Uh, is that, didn't, I didn't see like, uh, like, like. Oh, I know, we're, the, we're not very prepared. Uh, it's okay. Um, I, I guess, could, yeah, do you want to see what I have here? Do you need me to make copies at another time and bring it? That might be a better idea, but let's let's go through just some comments that we have first. And okay. Then, and maybe maybe one option would be um, I see we have some folks here tonight. We can open it to public comment to see what some some folks may have to, some thoughts on this as well. Right. Um, and I would maybe suggest that uh, take the comments and information here. We may uh, we may want we may want to table this. Give you a chance to assemble a lot of answers together. Maybe get a little more information together. Yeah. Um, and do a packet. Uh, obviously, um, you know, not every application comes with professionally stamped engineer or survey drawings, but we do like to see a little bit more information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So what we, so I guess what I, I personally would like to see um, uh, in, a, in this packet would be uh, photographs of the site. Okay. Uh, maybe a Google Earth image printed out, just annotated where things are going to go. Um, distances to the nearest property, the nearest uh, adjacent property or your neighbors. Um, if there is a, um, if you have some kind of business plan um, or anything like that, or just a, it, it, the information you provided here is good, but just a little bit more detail. Okay. Um, like I said, a site plan with, with rough dimensions. That house that you mentioned that was in view um, at the end of the 10 acre plot, is that your home or is yes. that someone? That is your home yeah. and that's your primary residence? No. Okay. No, not at the moment. Uh, okay. We live over in Buxton. Gotcha. We have it. We rent it out. Okay. But is, yeah. it is your property? Yes. Though. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess those are my quick questions right now. Again, uh, photos of this tent supplier. The tent supplier as a franchise must have some sort of informational. Oh, they do. They have a ton of it. I have it here. Yeah. I, so. I, would, I would propose making copies of that and, and probably submitting that with with your application okay. uh, next go around. Um, okay. But let's go through and, and any comments from the board first. This, I'll start with you, Mr. Bork. Thank you. Uh, in Just in reviewing the, the way you answer questions, you were saying no or yes or <laughs> whatever. Uh, what we need is evidence. You need to be able to show us why uh, something complies or doesn't. Okay. Uh, and uh, so th th this is just not adequate and I would certainly favor tabling this <coughs> until you know such time as you're prepared to. Okay. Come so back how to do I know to get these? Do I do a study? Do I do an impact study on the neighborhood or something? I mean, some of these questions are will will we be making a lot of noise? And well, I would suggest that you spend some time with Brian or somebody else in his department that could help you. Okay. Um, and looking at sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. Um, your, your sample answer in here would be you, you could say that you are providing a leach field for your outside showers. You have compostable toilets that aren't going to have any effect on the water supplier environment as well. Okay. So think, things like that we're going to need to see in here in order to really um, vote, go forward with it. If we were to continue forward with this tonight, I don't believe that it would pass. No, no. And I, and I, I, I apologize for coming in like I did. Um, but and, that, and that's okay. And that's okay. I appreciate the questions. We normally don't do this kind of, um, I'll say, you know, walk walk through on it. But here we are, and we are we will answer okay. your questions for you, uh, Miss uh, Miss Stevenson. Please. Yeah, I have a, a some. I know we're not actually maybe entertaining this, but something to consider when you're doing your application. Uh, you said that you would allow pets, and um, there's nothing about waste removal um, okay. so maybe some more information about that would okay. be helpful for us if you've learned anything from the past couple cases that you've listened to um, you know we ask a lot of questions about um, environmental impacts um, some logistical things um, just more detail yeah just okay. more detail okay no I understand now yeah I, I, I just came in here shooting from the hip so um, Never had a campground, so. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, additional questions? Yes, please go ahead, Ms. Snow. Thank you. Um, you. You must have well water at your house, do you? We do. So you'll check to see that the well is adequate to accommodate all those other people? Uh, yeah, I mean, we have, uh, we used to run a home business there 
years ago, and we would take, uh, so Katahdin Labs would do all of our testing, and they do our testing for, on all of our, so we have it, like I said, the seaweed company, and so we have all of our seaweeds tested for heavy metals through Kat Katahdin Labs, and we would well, use that. Well, besides quality, I was thinking about quantity. I mean, would one well service? Oh, it's a good point. It's a good point. Right, they um, may have, you know, you may want to consult uh, an, um, a surveyor or an engineer that may, and in, again, this is going to cost a bit of money for it, but if you're proposing for something this large, you're going to want to have a lot of that sussed out. Okay. Good. Yeah, well, that's okay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Frelinger? The other thing is you'll, you'll notice from the special exemption things, a number of these really talk about um, uh, neighborhood impacts, vehicular traffic, um, parking, uh, uh, hours of operation, those sorts of things, all of which will be very much of interest to your neighbors and, uh, and to the land trust property next to you. So I'm not sure if folks here are here to talk about that, but um, uh, we would definitely encourage you as part of this to do uh, uh, you know, uh, to do the footwork, to do the, the, the shoe leather work, to, to talk to your neighbors and get their sense of things and get their sense of where their fears or concerns or even support comes from for what may impact, what the impacts of this may be. So again, and, and first off, I, I really want to appreciate you being upfront and open saying, hey, you're new with this. This is, uh, you're, you're, you're kind of dipping your, dipping your, you've dove in the, in the pool by coming to the meeting, but um, you, you kind of know that you're not swimming very well. And I appreciate just the humility on that. So uh, it, it helps us kind of guide you through the process. It also helps too, I know there's probably members of the public here who want to talk about it. Um, uh, you're, we'll, we're going to give you a chance, but we're, we're, we're also going to give you another chance probably as well, because we want them to do this the right way. Um, I guess there are any comments, questions at this time from board members? Okay. I think right now, um, sorry, I'd like to open it to the public floor because we have some folks here. Mm -hmm. um, so if you would mind just having a seat for a moment. Okay. And, uh, I'll open the floor to the public here. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak? Yep, yeah. yep just come right up to the podium. Um, <laughs> state your name, uh, your address, and uh, what you would like to say. My name is uh, William Coates. I live at 335 Broad Turn, which abuts the left-hand side of his property. So the one... The land trust is on the right side. And you're on the other side. Got yeah. it. Okay. Got it. Um, one of the biggest things that, that concerns me is a fence. I shouldn't have to put up with, you know... Um, People coming over, animals coming over, um, and uh, it's roughly close to a thousand feet of fencing. And um, another thing I, I was reading in this here that they're saying about um, vehicle travel, pedestrian traffic, and stuff like that, it's only going to be a matter of time before someone gets hit out there on the road. Um, I've had deer killed laying in my driveway, um, and I've gone, I went this past summer to the police department to see if they could come out and do radar or whatever, and they said, well, we can put a box on the telephone pole, do a study, yada, yada, yada. I never saw no boxes out there. I haven't seen a cop out there in days, and, um. Uh, I just don't want it to, we've lived over there over 30 years, and it's going to be, I know how some of these campsites are, not this particular one, but campsites, that noisy, there's always screaming and hollering, if they get into the who hit John, you never know what they're going to do, and uh That's about it right now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming up. Anyone else? Uh, 
uh, Robert Baisley, and uh, I lived at 335 Broad Turn Road, grew up, grew up there in the late 60s, 70s. Um, actually uh, owned the land for a while as well, it was family farmland, used it. Um, I was in a golf course construction business, had a lot of construction equipment in and out of there. I actually built the existing driveway that's there. And we did have problems. We had a lot of road problems, accidents right there because of speed, which was what Bill was trying to articulate. Um, unfortunately, uh, both ways, because there's a curve right there. So anything that would increase the amount of traffic there um, should be addressed. I, there's numerous ways of addressing that, I think. But, um, you know, uh, but there, there is the potential. Uh, one of the things, too, I uh, read through the new uh, um, zoning uh, guidelines that were done in 2020, and uh, notice there's no definition of camping. And furthermore, I came in tonight with a lot of questions, more questions than concerns, as you had already pointed out, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, but there's a lot of unanswered questions. And um, so um, one of the things, there's no definition of uh, glamour camping, or what'd you call it, glam camping? Glam. Yeah. I, I'm glad that based upon what my mother had told me, and I came down earlier today and looked at your application and stuff, it really changed my whole perception of what was going to take place tonight. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that is scaled down. But one of the things I'd like to see addressed, because I've done a lot of clamping, um, I've done it with friends and stuff like that. Um, my youngest son now is 19. But, um, and as you mentioned, you're, you're targeting families. And one of the things that we always did, um, taking the kids with us, we usually took two or three of their friends. Um, I can remember the ML um, being loaded up uh, with a four bike racks, plus we had a couple up on the top, and head up to Acadia, and we did a lot of camping up there. Well, when you go into these camping grounds, you know, there should be more adult supervision, but there's a lot of adult supervision that's not there, and the kids are just flying around with their bikes. And my concern is inside whatever you have for a road structure, uh, will that accommodate bikes, number one? Uh, number two, how do we make sure that those bikes don't get out onto the broad turn road? Because if they go out onto the broad turn road, there's no bike lane there, there's no forgiveness whatsoever. And I, um, last spring, sat and waited for my mother, and within a half an hour, between the hours of 4.30 and 5 o'clock, <clears throat> over 117 cars went by at her driveway. And, you know, we kind of hold our breath every time we go out her driveway. And basically we have to roll down the windows and listen for cars coming. Well, there's a new wrinkle with that now. More and more electric cars, you can't hear them coming. So, um, but I'm really concerned and I don't know how much insurance you can get, but if a child gets killed out on the road there. So one of the questions I also had, have you talked with the, uh, the Scarborough Land Trust to see if you can have track access from the camping site? No, I have. So to avoid the, the broad turn road? No, I have not. Okay. Um, the other thing too, in talking with my friends this afternoon, I said, what's your definition of the glamour camping? Um, all of them had a little bit different definitions, but they all came down to one thing, electricity. Uh, you're going to have electrical supply to each one of these tents for heat and air conditioning. No, I would not. See, and that might be a problem. Like, this summer was extremely humid, and most everyone gravitated to air conditioning. Each of the tents comes with a solar panel, whether or not it would run an air conditioner. Well, would you be open to 
running electrical conduit underground to the tamp campgrounds, to the tents? I mean, I would, absolutely, but maybe not. You know, I'm so skeptical because I know nothing about this industry. I mean, I was a commercial fisherman, and then I'm a seaweed farmer and harvester. And I'm stepping in areas I don't know. Yeah, yeah. can we, one quick thing. Unfortunately, uh, so we need to capture your audio, so you have to come up it, and say it. But it, it, maybe it might be best if you to answer all your questions, uh, state all your questions, questions first, yes. and then you, can, and then you can get a chance to respond afterwards, and then we can we can go from there. Okay. Rather than the back and forth, because we got to capture it on the mic for the record. Yeah. I don't mean to offend or anything like that, but that's just what we, how we have to do it. So why don't you go ahead, sir, and keep going. Okay. Um, there is a lot of competition in that industry now. It's picked up in popularity. Um, the places I've been up to at Cater are absolutely beautiful. Um, I'd like, I would really like to see what type of structure. Um, to the other end of the spectrum, um, uh, Point Sebago has something similar that's on a deck, a structure uh, with a canvas over it that resembles a tent that now they're running a special on it for $150 a night right now. Mm -hmm. so, um, so there can be a huge um, difference in the type of uh, things that are, could be proposed here. And we'd really like to see what will be proposed. Okay. But the, uh, just the broad turn road is a problem with the speed up through there. Um, it is 45. As a kid, it was an unmarked, so it was 45 when we were kids. And it typically, um, I don't know, did the police actually put those sensors up to monitor the speed? Uh, at any rate, um, I'm guessing the average speed through there is, is around 55 to 60, if you was to actually measure it. And, um, you know, so. Allowing that speed to go unchecked creates a huge safety issue for anything that's being proposed here tonight. So, awesome. uh, the other thing too is uh, another question I do have: um, Who's going to run the business? Who's going to be there at night to make sure that no one is being loud? Um, it would be nice if you guys were living there at the house. Um, I don't know if that's, I've heard different things from different neighbors. Um, someone said that you may be moving back there. Um, that's another question. You know, will you be there to supervise um, any allowed people? You know, it's nice to put rules on paper. The question I have that I've seen, because I used to sell real estate, many times with these campgrounds, they have trouble well, I have trouble getting the police to enforce something that's beyond the town ordinance. So if the town ordinance says you can be allowed to 11 o'clock at night, and I'm not sure what Scarborough is at this point, he may be handicapped and cannot do anything about that. So, you know, if he calls the police, the police is, is going to revert back to the town ordinance. and But it still will generate a lot of... Uh, potential complaints. I also lived on 28 Dunstan Landing Row in the Wild Duck Campgrounds at the end of that. Different scenario, speed limit on that street was 25. Constant problems with people, with the campers, speeding on that road. My son's dog got hit and he stopped. And because what was happening, my son was playing with a ball, went rolling down the driveway, the dog biscuit, also could play with the soccer ball, ran out in the street. My son stopped, but the dog ran out into the street. And when he realized my son stopped, he, the guy stepped on the, the accelerator and ran over my dog, well, my son's dog. And um, one of the things I'm concerned about the glamour camping, you probably are going to have very high-end people in there, such as the wild the duck campground. They can be very arrogant. And sometimes some of them feel they are above the rules. So um, I don't have anything really negative about the wild duck, but I do 
have negativity towards some of the, the campers that are there. So they're not the best people to, uh, hit, you know, um, as neighbors sometimes. And uh, so um, have I covered all the questions? Okay. By the way, um, my mother's owned the land uh, there since 1968. 68? Okay. I'm not going to argue with <laughs> You're Best not to. So, um, um, so, you know, we know what the land is. Um, unfortunately, I think, as you already probably know, early <clears throat> spring or any time we have a rainy period, that ground gets soft. And I've been stuck in many, many times in it. It's a silty clay. Um, so here again, it'd be nice to know what kind of pathway you're putting in. Vehicles, are you gonna, a lot of people coming in, will come in from out of state. They're gonna wanna uh, call local people that they know and have them come visit. Um, do you have accommodations for uh, guest parking? Um, would be another concern as well. Um, so, those are my questions, and I'm, yeah. you know. No, I, I appreciate, it. and don't feel the need to necessarily address all of these now, um, since I, I think the, the the position of the board. And thank you very much. Was that were there all? Was that all your questions? That is all my questions. I. Still some, have some other concerns. I talked with Bill. Moving forward, um, and of course this was prefaced before we saw the proposal, but he was thinking um, about a stockade fence, the length of the property from Broad Turn Road down to the back property line. Um, there was concerns that campers might be coming over and grabbing firewood. However, with glam camping, they don't bring axes and saws with them. You know, they expect the wood to be cut there already for them. So I don't know how much of an issue that would be, but it would be nice if it does move forward uh, to make sure that there's no problems there sure. with entering onto the property to put up a six foot stockade fence. So all right. that's all I have. Thank you very much. And I appreciate, appreciate your comments. Um, so, Tom, I would say that, um... Mr. Chairman? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Farley. Can I make a suggestion? I, I don't want to put the applicant, uh, I think the, the, the board has made clear that we're probably going to table this for the yep. evening. Um, and I don't want to put the applicant in the um, position of making business plans or writing up changes to a business plan in a public forum um, on, on a broadcast of the ZBA. And I don't think we should be in the position of, of being on record at this point for specific objections to the board until we give the applicant an opportunity to come back with a more um, appropriate and complete application. So I, 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 I might suggest that I move to table this at this point. Okay. Um, is, is there a second? Ms. Snow seconds. Um, so discussion very quickly. I'll say, Tom, you've heard every, all the comments that everyone's here said tonight. Um, you may want to listen back to the YouTube uh, recordings. This will all be posted on the Town of Scarborough YouTube website. So you can go through and kind of hear the feedback that you've okay. heard from folks like I've heard about, you know, tent suppliers, uh, accommodating bike traffic on the property, a fence for protection, signage for where you can go, can't go, coordination potentially with neighbors and the, the land trust. There's a lot of things that have been said here tonight. Um, so I would take, I would probably go through and, and just sort of re-listen and kind of jot down and see, you know, uh, what are the, these answers that I can provide and pull together a more complete application okay. for you. No, I agree. And I appreciate it. And I understand their concerns. Yeah. You know, I mean, totally. That's a, it is a bad road. And I mean, it's really hard to pull out of their driveway and our driveway. Sure. Because you sure. just don't see very well. Right. But um, I'll get the answers that to their questions and and, we'll, and we can try this again. I, and I, yeah. I hope. I, I, would, I would say uh, working with, with Mr. Longstaff on it, but just for the record, we are in the middle of, uh, we're gonna table this now and Mr. Longstaff. And while we're still in discussion of yes. that motion. Go ahead. Does the applicant have any specific questions of the board before we, we table it? 
No, I, I think they, you, you know, I, I, make sure we get thank you. That. Yeah, I feel comfortable coming back again with your help. Yeah, no, please speak with Brian and, and his staff. And uh, again, thank you for coming before here. It's very, you know, it's pretty, pretty brave to come in like this. So it's, it's, uh, I'm glad that you're able to go through okay. and, uh, and, and gain some information. And, from and Mr. This, Chair, so. if I could just one more thing and then yes. get to your vote, um, just for the, the folks in the audience. Um, this is, this is a use that would have to go to planning board for site plan review. Okay. It needs to have this miscellaneous appeal for, uh, not a miscellaneous, special exception appeal because it's a special exception use in the RF. So you first need to have that before you go and spend any money putting a plan together for the, the, the planning board. But you will have to go to the planning board if you're approved here at, okay. at zoning board. And that will require perhaps a little more sophisticated plan, maybe not a ton more, but it, there may be some, some cost to preparing that application. So I can help you with the zoning board stuff. If you get past that hurdle, you probably want to consult with the planning staff at the town office okay. as well. Just, just so everybody knows. And that site plan review deals with many of the issues that you've raised, including traffic, including stormwater uh, treatment, uh, runoff, that kind of thing. Um, they they won't dive deeply into a business plan, but yeah, Mr. Freilinger's suggestion that it really is, a lot of these are business plan uh, functions. How are you going to operate your Oh, business? no, I, I, I mean, I agree. I'm up here just and, throwing and so frisbees site at plan and, 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 and zoning board don't necessarily drive, dive into <clears throat> your business plan, but these are all considerations that you probably ought to be thinking about. Okay. So, thank you. So that being said, uh, all those in favor of tabling this uh, application for one month? One yes. final comment. I, yes. I, I do want to thank the neighbors who came in and to, to, to offer your comments. Please don't think that we're putting a shilling on the side or anything like that. If anything, we're hearing you and we're asking the applicant to kind of go back to you guys and work with you. So um, thank you for coming. We appreciate your, your, your coming forward. And, and, and it's been a long night, so thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, man, we can't uh, we can't have a public comment right now. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we can we can we can yeah, public hearing is over for the moment. But all those in favor of tabling this application, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. We are tabled. Thank you. We still so we still have. Tom, we still have some business to go for in here. So if you guys yeah, can have a conversation, we might go in the hallway. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so right now, we are going to go into zoning board comments. Um, so uh, real quick, Mr. Longstaff, I think you have a comment you wanted to mention, maybe a reminder about our uh, meeting with the town attorney later this month. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a reminder that on October 26th, that's the Wednesday, the two weeks from today, we have Phil Sauce here coming to this room uh, to do a, an in-house training for you all. Please, uh, some of you, thank you. you. You already provided me with some possible questions or agenda topics. Phil loves to have those in advance so that he can prepare something, uh, you know, for you. He'll probably do his usual, just standard, going through some of the 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 uh, um, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? A definition of consanguinity. Well, no, we're not not necessarily that. Uh, Freedom of Information Act is what I was searching for. Gotcha. Very late. Um, so. <laughs> Consanguinity, we're not going to touch. <laughs> we'll leave that to we'll leave that to Phil. Um, but uh, but yeah. So if you uh, while it's fresh in your mind, perhaps tomorrow or the next day, give give you know give, get me your comments, your topics, things you questions, uh, so that I can get those to Phil in plenty of time, so that he can prepare some answers for you. Yeah, and think, we'll try to have some food here for you. And, great, and I know I think. Uh, both uh, David and um, uh, Peter mentioned some information about the shoreland zone, yep. some definitions, maybe a couple examples, and uh, we can really kind of nitpick apart so that maybe even taking the uh, application that we had tonight that dealt with the shoreland zone, and maybe we can use that since now it's public record, we can dissect that and just kind of use it as an example for discussion. Yeah. Shelly? Uh, I like my steak medium rare if you're doing food. <laughs> 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 you were bringing the lobster, weren't you? No. <laughs> 
<laughs> Any other comments from board members? <laughs> Actually, uh, go just ahead, to, Ms. Just to reiterate, the, the, the shoreline zoning, I think we brought it up last year, but <coughs> we didn't have an object example. So if we can have Phil bring an example to the table and walk us through, that would be great. Because uh, I'm certainly, I'm, 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 I'm developing my expertise and, and could use the, the assistance. Yeah, I mean, these are the questions for it. If you come up with something uh, in between now and the 26th, uh, send an email to myself and, and Brian. I will make sure that gets on the agenda for discussion. I'll provide a detailed list for the Yep, of appreciate that, Mr. Bork. Thank you. Good. Um, Anything else? Uh, one last thing. Um, I know we've, we've still got a little bit of time, um, but there will be some, some folks getting done on the board um, as of <laughs> he who shall remain nameless. I term out. Um, so I so be thinking well. about nominations. We will need a new uh, chair and maybe a co-chair or vice chair. Um, so please be thinking of that so that when we have those nominations, um, I don't know if we do them in December or January. We uh, we always forget to do them in December, so it ends up being in January, but they yeah. need to be done in September. Uh, September, <laughs> December. We've missed that. Uh, so yeah. what I would recommend doing is uh, potentially doing nominations in our November meeting, and then we vote on them for the December meeting. And that might be a little soon, but we'll... That might be a little soon, but think think about it. So I have to, uh, because I've been on the zoning board for so long, I have to take a mandatory leave from the zoning board. That's what I was going to ask. For is... one year, at least. Okay. Um, but yes, the, the, I have to go away to a faraway place. <laughs> uh, any other comments, questions? Uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor? Meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much.